Hi, I'm Paco Nathan with O'Reilly Media, and it's a pleasure today to get to speak with Ian Messingham uh, from AWS, uh, Technical Developer Evangelism at AWS. That's right. Yeah. Welcome, Ian. Nice to meet you. Uh, really appreciate your keynote this morning. Oh, it's great to be here. It's quite tough to do a talk like that in five minutes. So I, quite a challenge. <laughs> amazing, amazing performance to, to be able to get that concentration of information. Um, can you, so perhaps we could embellish a bit on that here. So, yeah. um, how is it that uh, the cloud enables innovation in AI? Yeah, I think there's natural affinity between the characteristics of cloud computing services like AWS and AI workloads. Uh, there's a few different dimensions to it. The first is, of course, that AI is fueled by data. And to really run very accurate and successful AI model development, you need large amounts of data, which is correctly annotated. And we find that customers tend to create and store lots of new data within AWS. We have a service you're probably familiar with called Amazon S3, which is a high volume, high durability, globally distributed storage service. And we also, also have a lot of ingest mechanisms to help customers aggregate and consolidate data on S3. So you can grab machine data using our IoT service or telemetry data from other applications using services like Amazon Kinesis. Collect your data within S3 at scale and then you can apply actually different types of computational workload to it. It might be analytics, it might be to put an API in front of your data and make it available as a product, or it might be machine learning for artificial intelligence apps. Uh, so once your data is there, you can apply mass scale compute to it to build models. And then on the model training side of things, uh, that is again a very computationally intensive task, and it's something that customers do not do continuously. You want to apply massive amounts of computing power to a data set do that repeatedly until you get a model which you consider to have a high level of efficiency, very effective model, and then deploy that out into production for inference. And it's that uh, spike of activity that's associated with model training that is really well served by high performance, high volume cloud computing resources. So there's affinity there. And then in the inference stage, uh, where you've got your model, you're deploying it, and you want to use it for making predictions about the world based on new data samples, here, you need durability, elasticity, and low cost. And again, characteristics of the cloud you'll know very well aligned with those particular uh, characteristics. So you can deploy inference work, put workloads behind endpoints. You can elastically scale those endpoints based on the amount of traffic that you have at any particular point in the day. Uh, and you can do that in a way which is secured as well by using appropriate role-based access control for your inference endpoints. So the cloud is a really good place to run the three phases in the ML workload cycle, data collection, training, and then longer-term inference workloads. Oh, fantastic. Uh, some of the examples that I believe you were showing earlier, or what we're showing earlier with AWS is uh, collecting the data could even be in a factory floor with robots, I mean, all the way out of the edge. Absolutely. We have a service called AWS Greengrass, which is a IoT operating environment. Uh, you can deploy that out onto gateways or edge devices and use that to uh, collect data. And you can also do inference there as well. So you can actually run machine learning out at the edge edge of the network right. out on these edge devices as well. Uh, and we have a data ingest service called AWS IoT, which is a simpler mechanism for collecting machine data from uh, robots or other uh, MCU or microcontroller powered hardware that you might have out in a, a factory floor, for example. So we have services for the edge as well. Oh, excellent. Um, how is it that AWS differentiates? I mean, now there's more cloud providers. So we operate our machine learning services at three distinctive levels within the stack. Okay, so the first is in the frameworks layer. So tools like TensorFlow, MXNet, and PyTorch, for example. We want to make AWS a really effective place for developers and research scientists to run whichever framework they wish. So part of our uh, offering is about openness. We provide a computing platform called the P3 instance family, uh, which includes high performance NVIDIA, GPU, FPU technology. And we have something uh, to make that more accessible to developers called the Deep Learning Army, which is a prepackaged gold build of an operating system environment that includes all of the common deep learning framework tools. We maintain it. We include things like the CUDA drivers, CUDA layer, which makes the FPU hardware accessible to deep learning developers in the framework that they wish to use. And that is a really simple process of access for developers. Spin up the machine, select the deep learning army, and in a few minutes you'll have a complete tools environment for you to use, which is open and includes many different framework components. So that's at the bottom level. The next thing is in the platform. Here we have a specific service called Amazon SageMaker. Uh, it's a tool chain for developing machine learning models and for deploying them for production or testing use. 
so you can prepare your data inside Jupyter Notebooks, a common interactive environment that Python developers often use in the data science context. You can train models at scale using these elastic compute capabilities that I talked about, and then you can deploy them for low-cost, manageable inference with elasticity and auto-scaling. So, and SageMaker includes over 14 built-in algorithms for things like uh, factorization machines, XGBoost, sequence-to-sequence, all kinds of different commonly used ML algorithms are built into the service. So that's a tool that is intended to make it really simple for software developers that might not be machine learning experts to train and productionize ML models at scale. It's also modular, so you can bring in a model from outside and run it on the SageMaker endpoint for inference. You can train models with SageMaker and take them out and use them elsewhere. You can even deploy them onto those IoT endpoints that I talked about directly from within the service. Or you can just use the Jupyter Notebook, or you can enter at any stage in the lifecycle. So it's an open platform for machine learning model development. That's in the second layer of platforms. And then at the top of the stack, uh, there's a whole category of software developers that don't want to know about everything that I've talked about so far. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just want complete simplicity. So here we have a set of services for things like image and video analysis, for natural language processing, for topic extraction, topic modeling, sentiment analysis, and also for helping developers to build conversational interfaces or chatbots as well. So we're also investing in building services where simplicity is the priority. Uh, it really makes it easy for front-end or mobile app developers to incorporate uh, AI features, so human-like capabilities, directly into applications. And what's under the covers there, of course, are pre-trained models of various types that we maintain, develop, and enhance, and developers plug into via an API. So I would say what makes AWS different is having really coherent offerings at every level of the stack that serve the different developer personas that exist in the AI and ML space. Oh, fantastic. For example, at the, the top level of the stack, we see so much in computer vision in yeah. terms of deep learning, so much of what will be shown here at the conference, and there is a service specifically for this. Yeah, we have Amazon Recognition, so it's a machine learning service intended for static image analysis, so non-moving pictures. I can submit my encoded PNG or JPEG to the endpoint, specify a particular method like detect faces or facial analysis or facial comparison or scene or image classification, and I'll receive back a documented format metadata structure that includes information about what's in the image. Uh, it's a man of 40 to 55 years of age. He looks happy. He is smiling, for example. <laughs> uh, you'll get that in an adjacent structure, in a metadata structure, which contains metadata about what's in the image. So that's one thing. And then the second is uh, recognition video. Very similar, but it operates over time series images in a video stream. So it can not only do analysis of each frame to say there's a 50-year-old or 45-year-old man in the frame or a 30-year-old woman in the frame. It can also track that person as they move around and it can detect activities. That person is walking, that person is running, that person is jumping. These are things that you can obviously only capture and analyze with accuracy if you consider the time dimension in the data stream. So the dynamics of the narrative. Yeah, exactly yeah. right. So we have that. I would say that another incredibly popular area for, for these kind of highly packaged, simple to access services in language though. So image recognition is substantial, but language analysis and speech generation are also really substantial service areas. Certainly for commercial applications these days. Yeah, yeah, for commercial applications, for training applications, even for creative use cases where I want to voice an audio book or oh, create a video yeah. that has sure. a creative narrative of spoken English or another language on top of it. Uh, we have a service called Amazon Polly that can generate lifelike speech in over 27 different languages. So you can voice your video uh, with creative voicing characteristics without needing to employ a voice actor. Wow, fantastic. Kind of fun. When I first started using AWS over a decade ago, I remember the initial release, there may have been less than a half dozen different services. Yeah. And I've watched this just escalate to the point now where it, it takes pages in very small font size to see all the listings. We have over 125 different services, and we have search functionality in the console so that you can organize them. So <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> when you go to the AWS console now, you can type in you know, uh, recognition, for example, spelt with a K, by the way, recognition with a K, and the uh, recognition uh, console will pop up for you, and you can then jump off into that and start to experiment with or configure the service. So we had to restructure our console because we were having a proliferation of services yeah. in this way. Well, well, even with that many, how is Amazon accelerating that pace? So uh, I would say that AWS and Amazon more broadly are organized very specifically for innovation velocity. So when we create new services, we tend to create brand new teams for those new services. And we have what's 
best described as a loosely coupled architecture for the business. So these teams operate independently as what, of one another. They're small in size. In fact, we call them two pizza teams. Uh, try two to PTs. Yeah, two yeah. pizza teams. We try to constrain them to a size such that they can be fed with a couple of large American pizzas. So, you know, it's not a strict rule of thumb, but the kind of guide is if your team needs more than that to feed for dinner or lunch, then it's probably too big and you're starting to introduce a communications overhead. So we tend to spin up lots of uh, teams to work on lots of different things concurrently, which means we can innovate on a lot of different fronts at the same time. And we're also not afraid of duplication. We can have services that perform similar functions. As long as those services have customers that regard those particular functions as valuable for them, uh, we're quite happy to have multiple services that do similar things oh, uh, to enable us to make sure that we're covering all of the different use case requirements that our customers may have. Interesting. Uh, now about Amazon SageMaker, um, how is this that uh, uh, we were talking a little bit before about being able to import or export. Can you go into a bit more detail about that yeah, process so, of training? Yeah, certainly. So within SageMaker, when you execute a training job, what you are running is an open source Docker container mm -hmm. that contains the training algorithm. Okay, And it's actually a pluggable architecture. So we ship these built-in models, as I've talked about already, for things like uh, gradient boosted trees or for sequence to sequence or for uh, factorization machines that you might use in a recommendations engine, for example. But you could also bring in your own containers. Okay, So you can package up your own Docker containers that might contain your own training algorithms, and you can run those on AWS. And this modular pluggable architecture allows us to bring very quick support for new tools that become available. We just announced a new version of PyTorch, for example, as, availability, as having availability within SageMaker by plugging in a new Docker container that contains that particular training algorithm. Okay, so you'll create models that are appropriate for whatever uh, algorithm you're using to train, and you can then take those out, okay, and then we provide another set of Docker containers which represent our inference endpoint workload containers. So you could take those Docker containers and run those independently of, AW of AWS on your own Docker-based infrastructure external to the cloud. So this is how the portability works with the container-based training and the container-based inference. And at each point, also uh, leveraging open source, best of breed coming out of open Absolutely. source. Absolutely, we want to provide developers with flexibility to use the tools that they're comfortable with, and also recognize the fact that not every deep learning or statistical learning use case is necessarily serviced most effectively by the same framework. Right. The idea that you'll have one kind of Swiss army knife for machine learning which solves all use cases is not that accurate. We find that developers working in different domains have different needs and want to use different frameworks. So we want to support everything that developers see as valuable and is popular in the developer community. Wonderful. Uh, we were talking about factory floor and robots and things. Uh, can you describe some other interesting use cases for how people are, are leveraging these ML services? Yeah, absolutely. So within Amazon, we have several use cases in our own right. We have recommender systems on the Amazon website, which you'll be super familiar with. Pretty much every, cu every customer that's ever used Amazon has seen or used that service recommended for you, and customers who bought this also bought, which are the two different categories that pop up on the Amazon website when you when you visit. Show of hands, who's used that? Yeah, pretty much everybody <laughs> everybody's used that. Personally I get a lot of uh, girls' gymnastics equipment recommended right. to me because my, my eight-year-old yeah. is a fan of gym and, <laughs> and buy her quite a lot of replacement gear. She seems to wear it out, so my purchase history is seeded with that kind of stuff, which is quite interesting. You can see it works. Uh, and then we have Amazon Go, which is our checkoutless retail experience, open in Seattle now for several months. That allows customers to purchase uh, products inside a convenience store, f a convenience store fi style format. Uh, without having to visit a cashier or visit a checkout. Just walk in, tap your app on the reader, walk into the store, pick up the product and walk out. And we use machine vision and sensor fusion in the built environment to figure out accurately what you've remo removed and, and charge you for it just a few seconds after you've left the store. So that's a use case that we have. And then in Amazon fulfillment, in our fulfillment centers, we do use robotics ourselves for automated materials handling and inventory management. Uh, so you'll see we have large fleets of robotic systems inside our newer fulfillment centers that are performing uh, stock management uh, tasks and are bringing inventory to our pick workers that actually take the product that you might have purchased on Amazon and place it in a, in a box for dispatch. So those are all internal use cases. And then looking out into the uh, customer community, we have customers like Intuit, uh, Digital Globe, Zillow, here in the UK where we're speaking today, we have the Royal National Institute for the Blind as a customer. They're using Amazon Polly to voice audio content for people that have visual impairments. So in 
the pre deep learning speech generation days, uh, short run periodic publications like magazines, they may well never have been transcribed into audio. You know, the audience was small and the lifespan of the publication was relatively short, so it might not have made economic sense to have a voice actor voice a piece of content like that. With Amazon Polly, organizations like RNIB can do on-demand audio transcription, so they can create audio streams in response to the needs of their customers and generate content in audio format to make it accessible for visually impaired or blind users. That's a customer that we have. And then in Hotels.com, <laughs> something similar on translation. So we have a neural machine translation service called Amazon Translate that allows customers to convert content from one language to another. And Hotels.com use that service for on-demand translation of hotel reviews. So if you visit a hotel that's only ever been visited by people that write reviews in German, uh, you can see a review in English at the point at which you visit the listing page for that property. And the translation is done on-demand. When you first hit the reviews, they're translated in near real time from German to English, and they appear in your browser in just a few hundred milliseconds. So you have all kinds of customers that are putting these technologies to work to improve efficiency and also to build new types of customer experiences for their customers. Wonderful. There's something I've been curious about too. You know, a lot of the discussion around the conference has been uh, highlighting how important operations, the DevOps side of things, yeah. is to it. And I can imagine that at Amazon, there's this. Uh, a world-class depth, a deep bench of understanding how to run very large-scale systems. Uh, is that expertise coming in to inform the teams doing machine learning services as well? Of course. When I talked about the service development model that we have with these two pizza teams, there's a lot of uh, layering within AWS. So when we build services, we build them on other services that we already have. Okay. So when we're talking about things like model training, or inference with existing models, those services are running on top of other AWS services that customers would, would already be familiar with and would already have used. It's just that the existence of those other AWS services within the stack is abstracted within a machine learning use case. So uh, say I want to train my model, we've got a service that makes it possible to access a large compute pool on demand for a short period of time. We make that available to the SageMaker team the SageMaker team build their special purpose service on top of that. And SageMaker inhabit, inherits the scalability and reliability characteristics of the underlying service. So it's how the stack works within AWS. And ultimately, of course, at the bottom, we've got things like EC2 and Amazon S3 that underpin everything. Very Foundation. well proven foundational services that have been operational for many years and have well understood performance, availability, durability, and fairly characteristics. So by building on top of pre-existing services, we can allow higher level services like SageMaker to inherit their characteristics. When we're doing things like deploying inference endpoints, we're placing them behind what we call SIG v4 API endpoints, which is the standard security and authorization model that is used for all other AWS services. We have a common authentication and authorization layer and we understand how to do things like instrument those endpoints for performance. We understand how to load balance them. We understand how to enable and recommend approaches for customers that want to do things like A-B testing with inference endpoints. So everything that you know about AWS and that so many developers and DevOps pros are familiar with is present within this new service, Amazon SageMaker, as well. So you can just transport over your knowledge about best practices for building AWS-based architecture and reuse that knowledge in the context of AI and machine learning. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Ian. No problem. Appreciate it.